All right, so the piece we have today is really a, an important piece by a really important guy in the 20th century philosophy of science, his studies in the logic of explanation. Here he is. Uh, really, I couldn't find many pictures of this guy. Um, he was born, I know, that's old school. It's like Mad Men kind of stuff. He was uh, born in Germany, but uh, his wife was Jewish or partly Jewish. And during the sort of rise of the Nazi party, and it ended up emigrating to Belgium and then eventually uh, coming to the United States. Uh, while he was uh, getting his PhD, he ended up um, becoming acquainted with uh, Karl Popper. Um, there's a lot more that I, I could say here, but I'm trying to be uh, concise. Um, there was a, a group of intellectuals. Uh, in Vienna called the Vienna Circle, which was sort of the beginnings of logical positivism. There was a similar kind of circle group of intellectuals in Berlin, which is where he was getting his PhD, called the, 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 the Berlin Circle. And basically these were folks who took logic seriously, empiricism seriously, and the notion that much of what's passed for problems in philosophy ended up being problems of language. And if we could eliminate, clarify, uh, that is, the ambiguities and and references and meaningless expressions that we would end up eliminating a lot of problems in philosophy, but more importantly, we would be able to use the language of, of predicate logic in order to formalize our statements, our scientific statements, in order to have a richer uh, understanding of the logic of scientific explanation, which is what we're going to focus on today, the nature of laws, the relation between laws and our observation statements, and so on. So this, uh, there's a whole bunch of folks that were concerned about this. Now, uh, Hempel never really liked the term logical positivism, though he really accepts a lot of, uh, many tenets of it. Um, instead, he preferred the term logical empiricism. But uh, Carnap was very influential to him. Carnap is one of the leading proponents of logical positivism. Um, Carnap was teaching in Chicago, so when Hempel left uh, Belgium, he ends up going to the University of Chicago and eventually gets his, uh, you know, uh, position there. He ends up teaching at Yale, a couple of other places, Princeton. And I mention uh, Princeton here explicitly because uh, he and Kuhn taught together, or at the same time, um, in the same department uh, for a number of years. So I've already mentioned that he preferred logical empiricism rather than logical positivism because that carries a certain kind of, certain number of conceptual baggage items that he didn't really like. He's known for uh, developing this, as we'll discuss today, the deductive nominological model of scientific explanation or the covering law model of scientific explanation. So we get those terms in the vocabulary because of him. And I just mentioned a couple of the pieces uh, that he's quite famous for. Uh, Studies in the Logic of Confirmation, which uh, obviously was published in 1943. He was very, very influential in the 40s and 50s, 50s and 60s probably, uh, the most prominent. Uh, decades for him. And then the Philosophy of Natural Science, which is a very small little uh, book published by Princeton University Press, I believe. Uh, it's a great book. Um, really summarizes a lot of the issues that we're covering in this class. There have been times when I've taught this class and I've required that particular text as a supplement. But since I end up doing some of the groundwork at, through my own stuff, you know, I don't, don't require it anymore. But it's a great uh, book. All right. So I think what I'm going to do is pause here, turn it over to Jonathan and his tome of a presentation. It's really an outstanding presentation, but he goes into a little bit more detail than what we really need. So I'm going to turn it over to you, and at some point, I've got more stuff here on the presentation that I'll, we'll go over. So go ahead, Jonathan. Survey the basic patterns of scientific explanation, analyze the concept of law, and analyze the logical structure of explanatory arguments. And this is so you can have a model of answering why phenomena occur rather than just describing that they occur. All right, so just describing it isn't an explanation. We need some framework in order to actually explain what's going on. So he's going to give us an account of that. So try to speak up a little bit more since you're in the back there. And some of the elementary parts of scientific explanation are the antecedent condition statements, which express the conditions that must occur prior to or simultaneous with the phenomenon to be explained. For example, the thermometer could consist of a glass tube and that there's mercury in it. So it's the particular situation, like 
parts of the experiment. And then there are general laws which connote universal principles at work upon the particular situation, for example, thermal expansion, which doesn't refer to any particular individual. And the vet is explained by showing how the phenomenon agrees with the general law given the particular antecedent conditions. Thus, the question, why does the phenomenon occur, is con construed as meaning according to what general laws and by what virtue and by virtue of what antecedent conditions does the phenomenon occur. All right, if that's not clear now, it will be here in a little bit, right? But basically, you need both the laws and the antecedent conditions that the laws identify that apply to particular things in order to be able to explain something. And what you're explaining isn't the event, it's the statement describing the event, okay? All right, so go ahead. Um, should I go on to the next section? Yeah, I think let's do that. The basic pattern of scientific explanation breaks down to two different types of sentence. The first is the explanandum, and that is the sentence describing the phenomena to be explained and not the phenomenon itself. And the explanandans. Explanands. Explanands. The class of those sentences which are reduced to the account for the phenomena. As shown in section one, explanands may either be antecedent conditions or general laws, and for those to be sufficient, has to be has to include general laws. All right, let's pause here for a second. Where have you seen terms that look like that before in this class? So who? Logic. Logic, in what context? You have like analysis. analysis. Right, so a conceptual analysis consists of uh, an assault, an an, 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 oh my God. I'm <laughs> not on any, I'm not on any pain <laughs> medication today. <laughs> An analysandum, which is the concept or whatever it's being analyzed, and the analysands. A definition consists of two parts, the definendum and the definends. The definendum is the term that's being defined, and the definends is that which does the defining. Similarly, explanations have parts too. So the explanandum is that which is being explained, that is, it's going to be that statement describing the event to be explained, and then the explanands, that will be the, the, the statements that actually do the work. You've, I, in fact, I like your little footnote here to adduced, Adduced means as evidence, and if you take a class in logic with me, I tend not to say premise and conclusion again and again. I tend to say evidence and claim. So basically think of it like this. The evidence in an adequate scientific explanation will consist in part of laws as well as antecedent conditions that those laws sort of specify. And then you deduce uh, the event to be explained, that is that statement from those two, and that, according to Hempel, is what's going to explain it. So he then defines these logical conditions of adequacy for the structure of an explanation. So let's talk about those. The first condition is that the truth of the explanandum must follow from the truth of the explanandans. And that is basically the concept of validity. That is, that the, ex the explanandum, that is, that sentence describing the event to be explained, must be a valid deductive consequence of the evidence, that is, of the premise. Okay. And one sentence in the explain and ands must be a general law, but no similar necessity is applied to non-law statements. That is, a sound explain and ands can contain only laws. So you don't need antecedent conditions for sufficient explain and ands, but you need a general law. You say here that a sound explain and ands can contain only laws for R2. Yeah. Does that, strictly speaking, make sense? I thought that's what he was inferring. I mean, he only applied the necessity of including general laws. No, you, you, need it, you need it to be true, right? You need the law to be true, but, and that's where the sound bit comes in. A sound, a sound argument is simply a valid argument with a true premise. But a sound explanant can't contain only laws because the laws are part of the explanant. So you need the laws and the antecedent conditions, oh, okay. and together they entail the explanandum. Gotcha. All right. And the third condition here is the explain and ends must have empirical content. That is, it's capable, at least in principle, of being tested or being observed. So here, again, he's, he prefers logical empiricism rather than to logical positivism. But the, tenet, the central tenet of logical positivism is this notion that 
Um, in order for a statement to be meaningful, it must be verified at least in principle, right? So you can't hope to provide an adequate explanation in science if the explanandum doesn't follow as a valid deductive consequence of the explanands, but the explanands must include statements with empirical content. Laws by themselves, strictly speaking, don't, don't do that. That's why you need the antecedent conditions. Because from a law and a law and a law, you can't deduce any statement about the world. That's why you need the, uh, the statements with empirical content as a part of the explanands, and those will be uh, the ones um, expressing the antecedent conditions. So those are the logical conditions of adequacy. We need the explanandum to follow as a valid deductive consequence of the statements in the explanands. Some of those statements need to be laws. Others need to be antecedent conditions specified by those laws. And together we've got uh, the, the statements of universal character, which we need. But we also have um, the statements with empirical content. All right, the empirical condition of adequacy. The statements of the explanands must be true rather than just well confirmed. Uh, why must this matter? Because if we only go by the standard of well confirmed, then it relativiz relativizes correct explanations to certain times or certain bodies of evidence. I think that's true. But there's another reason why they need to be true, which is what? And again, you've seen the form of this argument before. Um, it, it has a name, modus ponens. You know that any substitution instance of this argument forms a valid argument. And what makes it valid is that it's impossible for the premises to be true and for the claim to be false. So if you have an argument or an argument form and it's valid and the premises are true, then the conclusion is guaranteed to be true. So the point is, ultimately, he wants a form of an argument where the conclusion is a valid, I'm not saying this is it, but this is really isn't so far off. Uh, that the conclusion follows is a valid deductive uh, consequence of the explanands and where the explanands includes a universal statement as well as um, a singular statement you know, with empirical content. Um, what matters is the evidence needs to be true. False evidence is always bad evidence. So you can't deduce that the conclusion's true if some of the evidence is false. I mean, logically speaking. Because if the argument's valid, I mean, a valid argument can have a false premise. Uh, in fact, think of it like this. Um, if P, did I do that right? No, I can't do it for this. Q, false, yes, this will work. No, it, it can't work. Yeah, it has to be true. Yeah, it has to be true. All right. In which case, that's true yeah. and that's false. But uh, you can't deduce that the conclusion's true when not all of the evidence is true, is the idea. So I've probably gone into too much detail about the point, but the point is uh, ultimately, in order for an argument to be good, um, the evidence needs to be true. Because you can't deduce anything about the truth of the conclusion, regardless of whether it's valid, if the evidence isn't all true. So truth matters here in this context. All right, so we've got that empirical condition of adequacy. And he says, following that, uh, the sentences constituting the explanations must be true, uh, that in a sound explanation, and again, it's that logical term, sound applies to valid arguments with true premises. So you can't, you won't be justified in claiming that the conclusion's true uh, unless the premises are true and it's valid, because that's the only guarantee that you get. All right, so then he gives us this nice diagram that you have here. So take a look at the diagram that Jonathan has, which corresponds to what we've got in the text. Notice that this is not the form of an argument as such. You can't plug in statements for C1 and C2 and C3 or whatever, and L1 and L2, and then E, plug in a statement there. This, strictly speaking, isn't the form. It's more or less like a kind of schema of the form that the argument needs to make. But notice that the explanands and the explanandum are the two parts of the explanation. The explanation requires a valid deductive argument whose conclusion, the explanandum, is a valid deductive consequence of the explanands. And the explanands must consist of both antecedent conditions and laws. Now I've got an example from, in fact, <laughs> it's from the little intro, but we'll actually be talking about this example in the piece that we'll cover on Tuesday. So let's 
just think about this for a second. All right, suppose we've got this piece of wire here. I can say a number of things about this, this particular piece of wire. This is a single piece of wire. It's just, you know, wound up the right way. I could say this piece of wire represents a human being. This piece of wire uh, would make a nice pin. Uh, this piece of wire, I could say a number of things about it, but I could also say that this piece of wire conducts electricity. So this piece of wire by itself, strictly speaking, isn't a name, but I, I could call it Bob. So I could say Bob conducts electricity, or Bob would make a nice pin or whatever. But in this case, <coughs> the statement is that this piece of wire conducts electricity. And as a statement, it's either true or false. Now, the way that we symbolize, and this is going to confuse Chris probably, but the way that we symbolize this statement, this piece of wire conducts electricity in the language of sentential logic, would require using a single letter. Because sentential logic doesn't allow us to reveal the internal logical structure of atomic statements. So I've got this piece of wire conducts electricity. So if I use the predicate function that you see up here, EX, to take the place of X conducts electricity, and I use A as a name for this particular piece of wire, then I can symbolize um, what this statement asserts in the language of predicate logic this way, EA, where A is an E. That is, A uh, conducts electricity. Are you with me there? Uh, the advantage of using predicate logic over sentential logic, because if I were to symbolize this in sentential logic, it would be P, where P equals this piece of wire conducts electricity. I have no symbols in sentential logic to reveal the internal logical structure of it. So the issue here is what explains that EA is true? Now, whether it's true or not, that is, this piece of wire conducts electricity, electricity is a statement. Statements are either true or false. I'm not asking whether it's true or false. I'm asking why it's true, if it's true. That requires an explanation. And according to Hempel, explanations consist of certain parts, right? So let's take a look at another version of Jonathan's uh, diagram here. So this is called the deductive nominological model of scientific explanation. The deductive bit refers to the fact that E, the explanandum, the, the statement describing the event to be explained must be a valid deductive consequence of the explanations, that is, of the evidence, of the premises. And the premises must consist of two kinds of statements. Laws, so I've got law one and law two and law and so on, through however many laws there are. So it's a conjunction of laws and a conjunction of the antecedent conditions that are specified by those laws. Okay? This isn't a form of an argument in the same way that if P then Q P, therefore Q. You're guaranteed to come up with a valid argument if you plug in statements for P's and Q's here. Okay? That's not, strictly speaking, the form of any argument. But this tells you the kinds of statements that you need uh, in order to be able to have an adequate explanation in science. Okay? So you need the laws. You need the antecedent conditions. And from the laws and antecedent conditions, the E, the, the event to be explained, that is the, the statement describing the event to be explained, must be a valid deductive consequence of it. Are you with me here? OK, so let's take a look at another rather better example here. So we have this piece of wire co uh, conducts electricity. We're asking, what explains it? Well, in English, take a look at the bottom first, right? All copper conducts electricity. Uh, and that is in sort of the language of predicate logic. For any x, if it's copper, then it conducts electricity. Is how we might paraphrase it to capture what's being asserted there. That uh, is a universal statement. And as Hempel will say later in the piece, it's more of a law-like statement than a law itself, but it works good enough for our purposes here. Notice that the antecedent condition in uh, all copper conducts electricity is, uh, requires that you need, that is, all copper conducts electricity. That is, for any x, if it is copper, so you need something being copper, uh, and for it to be a specific thing, that is something that you could observe, uh, test, measure. It's not, not a statement without any empirical content. And then you can conclude, in this case, that this piece of wire conducts electricity. So if we were to read the argument in English, it would look like all copper conducts electricity, this piece of wire is copper, therefore this piece of wire conducts electricity. In the language of predicate logic, it allows us to see better, I think, the, the structure of what's actually going on. Notice that. Uh, all copper conducts electricity would be symbolized how in the language of sentential logic? 
We've, I may confuse folks with either P or S, so let's uh, C. In the language of sentential logic, I would fully translate all copper conducts electricity with a single capital letter because single capital letters in sentential logic take the place of atomic statements or statements we have to treat like atomic statements, like non-truth functional compound statements. So the, my dictionary for C would be uh, all copper conducts electricity or all copper uh, is an electricity conducting thing or whatever. In the language of classical logic, how would I translate all copper conducts electricity? Christopher, what type of statements being asserted in premise one? All copper conducts electricity. Uh, universal fermion. And how do we? How would we translate that sentence into the language of classical logic? All C is something that conducts electricity, so whatever your constant would be. So all C is E or E X. No, it can't be that. No, 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 no. How, that is, all copper, copper is clearly the subject term, what's the predicate term of conducts electricity? That sentence doesn't have a copula, so we need some form of the verb to be. So all C is, or all C are, what? What term should I use for the predicate term? Conductors. Conductors. Say that again? All copper is conductors, all copper are conductors, all copper is, <laughs> are things that conduct electricity probably the least elegant, but that, that works. And how do we want to translate that? We can't use C, we're going to use a C. B. B. Uh, where C equals copper, or things that are copper. Yeah. And B equals what? Conductors, conductive metals. Uh, conductors of electricity. Yes. I'm writing fast and messy. All right, you with me here? Yes. So B, all right. This is um, all copper conducts electricity uh, fully expressed in the language of classical logic. Now, if we were to symbolize this in the language of predicate logic, notice that we do something like this. Like I've got C and an EX here, but in fact, let me change this to an E just to be. Um, for an EX, CX, then EX, that the, the quantifier in classical logic is the word all. The quantifier in predicate logic, and again, you're not going to have to translate anything on the exam, and most of you have had logic of the, the quantifier in uh, predicate logic is this X in parentheses. So we paraphrase what this says this way by saying for any X, if it's a C, then it's an E. Where if it is copper, then it uh, conducts electricity. This isn't a conditional statement. Whereas the if P then Q that you see here, that's the form of a conditional statement. That's a truth functional compound statement that consists of two statements conjoined with if then, right? This is an atomic statement. All general statements are atomic statements. But what this form allows us to identify is the antecedent condition, because it's, got, it's not exactly a conditional, but it's sort of in the form of a conditional. Right? It's, it's conditional-like, in that if this is the case, then this is the case. But this is still an atomic statement. So what we need is the law, which is universal in character, uh, which is number one here, uh, on my argument. Number two is CA. That is, I've instantiated this universal here with the, the particular individual A and from this and this what I can conclude this, oops, messy, as you see in the slide over there, EA. Because then I end up with uh, essentially a conditional, the antecedent of that conditional I deduce the consequent. This is a valid argument. So this conclusion is a valid deductive consequence of this and this once I instantiate X with A is how I sort of formally. The point is 
I've got an argument here whose conclusion is a valid deductive consequence of the evidence here, and the evidence includes both uh, a law or law-like statement and the antecedent condition, which supplies the empirical uh, condition of adequacy. So we're not really concerned with the problem of deduction with the evidence, just so long as we establish that the evidence is empirically verifiable, it counts as evidence of a deductive argument. So we just write about the, the form of the logic of the argument. No, I'd say we, we are concerned with the induction, right? Because if this is true and this is true, this must be true. This isn't inductive at all. This is right. deductively but, valid. Yes, but he, he doesn't, he, he's not really concerned so much with the problem of induction in terms of specific evidence. So long as, so long as we accept it as empirical evidence, we can, we can place it as a deductive argument in this form. That is, we can put it in the form of a, a deductive argument. Yeah. Um, where the event the statement describing the event to be explained can be deduced from a law or a set of laws and a set of antecedent conditions. Right. In the same way that falsification for Popper, if H, then O, not O, therefore not H. And again, this is probably too naive, to oversimplified. But we know that this has to be the case if this is the case. If our hypothesis is true, then we ought to observe the world being a certain way. We test it. We don't observe it. Therefore, we know conclusively, necessarily, that this must be false. We know conclusively, necessarily, that this must be true if these are true. So we go back to the conditions that, well, the evidence needs to be true. So uh, what he gave us in that diagram that Jonathan has here, what I gave you in the one before it, whoops, darn it, uh, go back to it, just so we can see it dun, 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 here. That, strictly speaking, is in the form of an argument like modus ponens is the form of an argument. You can't just plug stuff in, but it's got to go in the right place here. So the E is going to be that statement describing the event to be explained. In order to explain why it's true, you need laws, um, at least one, and you need the antecedent conditions that law specifies. And again, think about conditionals, which we've talked about and needed to talk about earlier. This is the form of every conditional in the universe, if P then Q. Conditionals consist of two parts. One's part, one part's called the antecedent, the other part's called the consequent. In order for the whole thing to be true, the one thing that can't happen is for that to be true and for that to be false. Whenever the antecedent, that is the antecedent condition for the whole thing, because what's being asserted is that, is that if that's true, then that must be true too. So when that's true and that's false, then what the whole thing asserts is false. So although this, strictly speaking, isn't a conditional statement, it's, it captures a conditional relation uh, in a true universal affirmative. All right. Jonathan, take her away. All right. She adds a few extra things that the sound explanation should be able to do. And one of those is it should have predictive force, such that if you have the antecedent conditions and the laws are true, then you should observe what they explain. And also, he goes into why a law is necessary for the... Well, let's pause there about that predictive stuff. He says on, below the presentation of that diagram that we have in the text, it says, let us note here that the same formal analysis, including the four necessary conditions, applies to scientific prediction as well as to explanation. The difference between the two is a, of pragmatic character. If E is given, that is, we know that the phenomenon described by E has occurred, but a suitable set of statements, C1, C2, L1, L2, and yada, yada, is provided afterwards, we speak of an explanation of the phenomenon in question. If the latter uh, statements are given and E is derived prior to the occurrence, then it's a prediction. So basically, whether the issue isn't whether E, that is, the explanandum follows. If it follows and it's already occurred, then what we've got is an explanation. If it hasn't occurred yet, then it's a prediction. So for him, the, d the difference between an explanation and a prediction really isn't a difference that makes a difference when it comes to logic, because the logic's going to be the same regardless. Are you troubled by that at all? And I'm, I hope you wouldn't be, because science is in the business of telling us what exists, of explaining why it is that way and predicting how it's going to be in the future. And what Hempel is doing here, above all, is giving us the framework 
for an adequate explanation in science. Uh, and it's a logical framework that has empirical conditions of adequacy too, not just logical ones. And prediction, it turns out, has a logical framework as well, um, as well as you know, empirical ones, empirical uh, conditions that apply to it. And that's what's being captured here. Or, I'm pointing to my screen. That's what's being captured over there. All right, Jonathan. Um, Do you want me to skip to the next section? I'm looking to see how much detail you go in there. Um, he does talk about the difference between causal explanations and teleological explanations, um, which I guess is in the next section. Therese, let's go on there. Go ahead. All right. Uh, Hempel extends his characterization of scientific explanation beyond the physical sciences, and the general principles of the explanation are used as a sound explanatory framework for non-physical sciences such as psychology or economics or linguistics. And he notes that oftentimes explanations in these fields rest on teleological reasons. And teleological means what? Uh, pursuant to some purpose. Some goal and or purpose of thing, um, as opposed to a causal explanation. Um, he says, while illustrations of this kind uh, tend to support the view that explanation in biology, psychology, and the social sciences has the same structure as in the physical sciences, the opinion is rather widely held that in many instances, the causal type of explanation is essentially inadequate in fields other than physics and chemistry, and especially um, in the study of purpose of behavior. What do you think about that? Do you think that an adequate explanation of human behavior must appeal to some combination of beliefs, desires, motives, goals, purposes, or would, it, would a, an adequate explanation be a purely causal one? He makes a point that you can characterize motivations in a causal way where the beliefs exist as antecedent conditions at the time of before a certain phenomenon. Uh, so it's not teleo teleological in the sense that it's pursuant to some purpose in the future, right? but rather it's a present mental state. Um, yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head here. Um, this is in the paragraph that begins, it's a big paragraph. Uh, a third argument insists, well, sort of in the middle of that, uh, on that sort of in the middle, but unquestionably many uh, of the frequently incomplete explanations that are offered for human actions involve reference to goals and the motives. And he says, to put it in crude terms, uh, it is A, uh, his desire to, pre to pres his desire present before the action to attain a particular objective and his belief Likewise, present before the action that such and such, well, of course, an action will most likely have the desired effect. Uh, the determining uh, motives and beliefs, therefore, have to be classified among the antecedent conditions of a motivational explanation. And there is no formal difference on this account between motivational and causal explanation. Now, I've mentioned this to you explicitly in this class already once. And I do so in my philosophy of mind class as well. But the idea is this. Um, in folk psychology, uh, if we embrace the notion that uh, people tend to act on their beliefs in order to get what they desire as a general law governing human behavior, um, I can provide a causal explanation in this framework by, again, assuming that people, that as all things being equal, people, uh, human beings uh, tend to act on their beliefs in order to get what they desire. We could phrase that in a variety of ways, but it's going to be universal. It's not going to apply to a particular individual. It's going to have all the features of laws that we're going to be talking about here in a second. So if we accept that as a law governing human behavior, that humans tend to act on their beliefs to get what they desire, and we identify the antecedent condition that uh, I believe that I'm thirsty and I desire not to be thirsty, then there are certain things that I can do that I, you know, in terms of my belief that I can satisfy my desire. What might be the antecedent conditions um, that need to be met in order to explain why it is that I bring in a bottle of, in this case, it's a bluish bottle, I'm sort of color coordinated. Uh, what might be the antecedent conditions, given the assumption that uh, all things being equal, humans tend to act on their beliefs in order to get what they desire, what might be the antecedent conditions that allow us to deduce that 
Rob brought in a blue colored bottle. Oh, non alcoholic. Could be prior, it could be prior experience of teaching without water and then. No, you need to be making reference to a certain combination of beliefs and desires here. Because he's saying that that belief desire framework isn't really incompatible with the causal logical framework that he's already articulated. You believe so, that if you drink water, you won't be thirsty. I believe that if I drink water, I won't be thirsty. Right. You desire not to be thirsty. I desire not to be thirsty. You need, you believe that you need to have the water with you in order to drink it. Okay, that, that works. I can assume that. But can I deduce that, therefore, Rob brought in a blue colored bottle of non alcoholic? Do you like to be quote yeah. color coordinated? That you're wearing? That is, yeah, we could keep going on, right? But the idea is that people provide those kinds of explanations all the time in folk psychology. And what Hempel's point is, there's really nothing incompatible between those style of explanations and the framework that he's supplying here. But what's the problem with those style of explanations? Beliefs and desires aren't, aren't in the same empirical character that some people like, uh, have observational evidences. Yeah, I know. It's, you can't really see anyone's belief. Yeah. Uh, you can infer that they believe such and such based on what they do, but no one's ever seen a belief. Yet you gotta take my word for it that I'm not trying to, that I'm not deceiving you. Um, it's not an alcoholic beverage. Taste it yourself. Um, that could be empirically determined. That, is, that could be. But the problem with beliefs and desires ultimately is that even if um, I deny that the beliefs and desires you saddled me with are the ones that are actually motivated by behavior. We could always come up with some other set of beliefs and desires and that law that says that people tend to act on their beliefs in order to get what they desire in order to explain why it is that I brought in a blue bottle with this refreshing non-alcoholic beverage in it. Right. In, order, in, order for, in order for this, for the empirical arguments to be logically valid, they have to be true and there's no way of verifying the truth of belief because he's already built into his program that empiricism is the validation for truth yes. in a logical state, but there's, there's, no, there's no similar program for beliefs or desires. Not, not conclusively. I mean, if, if we want that to be sort of the standard, I mean, because I can always be deceiving you. There's just no way for you to know that I believe what it is that I believe. Because people tend, believe it or not, uh, to be able to be quite good at hiding their beliefs, that is behaving in a way that's inconsistent with what they actually believe. That's right, it can be. But that, in terms of empiricism, isn't such a bad thing because we've already accepted the notion that there isn't anything that we now uh, believe to be the case that we couldn't give up in the face of better evidence to the contrary. So it's not like, well, we, it must be something about which we are certain. It's just beliefs and desires end up being sort of problematic here. We can't observe them and test them. I mean, we can prod and poke. You know, we can torture someone. I mean, there are things we can do, uh, but... Um, it's not the same standard, and it ends up being kind of question begging here. In the same way that Freudian psychology was unfalsifiable, folk psychological frame, uh, explanations in this framework are unfalsifiable as well. So his point isn't that point. Rather, his point is that those style of explanations which appeal to beliefs and desires still end up assuming this kind of universal law as a part of the framework, and hence that framework really is compatible with the causal framework that he's defending here that we use in the physical sciences. So since I make this point in a variety of classes, I want to make sure that we made that here. So, and he ends up saying that uh, a potential danger of explanation by motives lies in the fact that the method lends itself to facile construction of ex post facto accounts without predictive force. That is, you see someone do something. Well, why did they do that? What explains that? Well, they must have believed this, and they must have desired that. And then so-and-so comes back and says, no, nah, that's not what I believe. That's not what I desired. So you can always construct these sort of after-the-fact explanations um, in this framework, which could be completely false. And that is a danger here. So they need to be capable of tests. Uh, we need suitable general laws if we're going to use this particular framework here. All right, Jonathan. That was the main point there. Uh, and the problem of the ex post facto, bottom page four. But anyway, going on, he does note that teleology is persistent in the biological sciences particularly. And he doesn't think that many biologists 
really mean to say that te teleological reasons are why things happen, but they use it as a heuristic device or as a learning device to try to understand bodily systems. Like they frame the question of why the heart pumps blood in, in te teleological ways to make it more easy to understand. Do you think a teleological view of the heart is the best way to look at the heart and to understand what the heart does? No, but it's, it's an easy way to approach the problem at first. How? What would be the teleological approach to the heart? The heart pumps blood for the purpose of providing oxygen to the rest of the body. If we're using purpose in the sense of function, I don't have a problem with it. But if we're using teleological in the sense of some kind of design, that presupposes you know, a designer, that there's some intentionality there, then we're going to run into problems. So I agree with you. If we construe teleological, it has to do with end, function, or purpose, simply in terms of function, then we're OK. What does the heart do? What's its job? Well, it's not that the heart thinks to itself, well, I need to do this. I mean, there's no thinking going on. What What's its purpose? Job? We know the heart has a job. It has a function, and its function is to pump blood. Um, we can. Uh, create mechanical devices that implement the same function. So the function is going to be the rule that the heart's following. And I'm mentioning that particular example because we tend to use that example in computational or functionalist explanations of things or accounts of things. And functionalists aren't concerned really with the physical properties as such. It's what, it think, what the thing does, what its function is, what its purpose is. But that's not goal in the sense of say in the case of evolution, there being some design, some purpose going on, sort of driving evolution, um, because that's teleological in a completely different sense of teleological. That is, that's the sense of teleological in the sense of what we call the teleological argument for the existence of God. That's a different sense here. So it's easy not to see that distinction here when you're just reading the, through the text. All right, we want to get to laws. Right. So. And in order for propositions to be laws, they must be true rather than highly confirmed. And this is the same standard of the analysands. And this standard avoids relativizing laws as sets of evidence said before. And a law must be expressed by a law-like sentence. And what exactly that is is kind of vague at first, but it does develop a little further to say that all law-like sentences must be universal in quantification. For example, uh, for any x, yada, yada, yada. Like the example you see up here, right? That's an example of a universal affirmative statement expressed in the language of predicate logic. It's universal and it's, uni and it's uh, affirmative. It's universal because the only option is that it's existential. This isn't asserting that there exists something. Rather, this is a making an assertion about all of the members of one class uh, being members of another class. So it's universal. And also, a law-like sentence must be in conditional or con conditional in form. All right. It doesn't have to be a condition, like if P, then Q. That is, it doesn't have to be a conditional, but it has to have some conditional character. And that does. All S is P, in the language of uh, classical logic, is how we would express the form of a universal affirmative statement in the language of classical logic. Uh, for any X. If it's an S, then it's a P, would be how we would translate this in the language of predicate logic. This reveals, I think, better the full logical structure of what's being asserted here. Are you with me? So this says, for any X, if it is an S, then it is a P. This is not a conditional, um, because this is not if SX, then PX, because X is a variable. X isn't referring to any specific named individual. So um, this is a universal affirmative um, in con conditional form, but it's not itself a conditional. Can right. point that the conditional form is not necessary since conditional statements can be reduced to non-conditional? He makes that very point, in fact. So yeah, I didn't understand that at all. Oh, that's easy enough to, to capture. All right, so this is the form of every conditional statement in the universe. Conditional statements are truth functional compound statements. You can take a statement, you take another statement, and you can join them with if then the results are conditional. It may not be reasonable. Sophie's a cat. 
Obama is president. If Sophie's a cat, then Obama is president. Is it conditional? Um, there's no law there. The point is any two statements can be conjoined with if then in the same way that any two statements can be conjoined with and or 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 if and only if. The thing is this statement is a conditional. There are an infinite number of statements that this statement is logically equivalent to. One of them is this one. But the reason that it makes sense to me is because can you do the same with the universal quantification and transform it to something that's logically equivalent? You can once you instantiate it. So once you instantiate each occurrence of x with an individual constant. But you can't do that without instantiation. You, you can't, no, because uh, you can't transform I haven't made this too complicated. Um, you can't transform this into this. Right. This is an atomic statement. This is a disjunction. What this says, or what this is capturing, is that every conditional statement is logically equivalent to a disjunction whose antecedents being denied. There's a rule, you know, that it's called implication, that says this statement form is logically equivalent to this statement form. <laughs> and this is logically equivalent to Q or not P, strictly speaking. Uh, and this is logically equivalent to not not Q or not P. And I could go on. But the point is, this can be transformed into this through one of the rules of replacement. And this can be transformed into this through another rule of replacement. And this can be transformed into this by another rule of replacement. So he's not committing himself to the notion that a law must be in the form of a conditional. Because if, if it's conditional, then it's not universal. And you can't transform. Um, transform this, I mean, you can't do this for any x. Well, I guess there's a w way in which it sort of follows. Uh, not s, x, or p, x. We don't have a system that allows us to do that. And if that's true, then for any x, um, p, x, or not s, x. I mean, there's a sense in which that's logically equivalent to that. But the point, the point is, this is a universal affirmative expressed in the form of a universal affirmative. This is not, this is universal, but, and it's affirmative. I, I mean, how do you even tell now? So no, we tend not to think of the rules of replacement as, as applying to, uh, within a, a general statement, because general statements are atomic statements. And these rules don't work that way. So is it saying that the atomic statements themselves can be altered uh, when you're I mean, can they, can they be transformed maybe in the sense of <coughs> going from a... Uh, no. Uh, I mean, some people have had logic, other people haven't, right? So some of you know the rules of natural deduction, others of you don't. And generally speaking, the rules of replacement um, apply to parts of statements as well as whole statements. Rules of inference apply to whole statements only. And there's a way I could... I can massage the, the rules of replacement such that we can make uh, transformations within a quantification to a statement that's logically equivalent to it. So that much is okay, right? But I think his point is still the same, that this um, is not a conditional statement, but it's got the right sort of form in that it's universal, it's law-like. Uh, it identifies what the antecedent condition must be when we instantiate whatever this is. Because if we instantiate this, we replace the x with an a, a b, a c. If we apply it to a specific individual in the universe, um, and that is from, I'll write it over here, from for any x, if sx, then px, and to sa, then I'm going to be able to infer, deduce PA, not directly from 1 and 2, but only if I instantiate uh, X with A. We've talked a lot about logic in this class, even though you know, this isn't a logic class, but you're seeing why it's so important. We can't even understand the nature of the structure of explanation in science for Hempel without the ability to symbolize statements and what statements express. So again, he calls himself a logical empiricist for a reason. It's using the language and methods of formal logic to eliminate ambiguity, to be precise and concise in terms of how we express uh, statements, laws, and regularities you know, in science, and how to deduce 
what must be the case given these laws and these statements identifying you know, what's the case in the world. All right, so we need to identify some of these other features of laws. Considers one statement which meets the first few uh, conditions he set out, that every apple in basket B at time T is red. He doesn't think this is truly law-like. And from that, he tries to figure out why is this not law-like. Law and he says because it limits the scope of the statement to a particular set of objects that doesn't really seem like a law anymore. Yeah, I mean, think about it. I could form a universal generalization based on, say, the behavior of my students in this class. But would that law really allow me to explain or predict what's going on? You don't want to talk about the specific time that you are That is, if, if it only applies to the specific individuals in a specific class at a specific time, well, then it's, 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 a, it's not a law, but it's, it has the form. It sort of has the quasi-form of a law in that it's universal in character, applies to a range of individuals. But the scope of it's so limited, it's really not doing what a law is supposed to do. And a law isn't supposed to only uh, range over uh, a small number of individuals in a very narrow range. It's supposed to be universal, right? All of the individuals that meet the antecedent condition. So the condition he draws from this is that a statement that is truly law-like cannot reference any one particular object or spatial temporal, temporal location, such, which means that it has to be purely qualitative, it has to be universal and not limited to a domain of individuals. Uh, that is a domain of specific individuals or a specific time or a specific place. Otherwise, it's really not a law. Laws need to to be expressed with qualitative terms, not wedded to uh, specific individuals at a specific time or a specific place. Because then, well, sure, you can, in, retro, in retrospect, explain why someone did, if you can come up with a law that only applies to those individuals at that place at that time, but that's not going to give you any sort of predictive force about what's going to happen in the future. So you need to strip the laws of the non-qualitative bits having to do with specific times, specific places, specific individuals. It also makes the explanation trivial. The law only applies to that set of individuals and you have that set of antecedents almost tautologically true. Exactly right. Uh, we'll be talking more about this in the next couple of pieces. Any other features of laws? Not really. He goes into purely qualitativeness a lot more, but it's kind of complicated. I don't yeah, but he does talk about the, the benefits of a formalized language oh, yeah. in that section. To attempt a uh, definition of the concept of law, uh, with, not with respect to English or any other natural language, but rather with respect to a formalized language. This is going to reference a well-determined system. And what you see symbolized here on the right screen is the product of a system like that, where you explicitly identify all and only the symbols that you find in that particular system. You identify... Uh, the semantics, the meanings of all the, the key concepts. You identify the grammar, all and only the ways in which the symbols can be combined in order to form something that's what's called a wolf, a well-formed formula, grammatically correct sequence of, of symbols. But the idea is I can't expect it to become, to be fluent in the language of predicate logic, but gosh, a little bit of logic really goes a long way in this class. And before, really we were focusing on informal logic, uh, not even on uh, sentential logic, much less predicate logic. But there's a reason why we require that majors at least take logic. I, I think it would be nice if we could require that everybody take advanced logic, too. Everybody's just really not comfortable uh, introducing predicate logic to folks at, at 1,000 level logic class, even though I've taught at places. Uh, in fact, I was in graduate school at Washington University. Uh, Joe Yulian, who's half of who authored that piece that you're going to be doing, uh, I was TA for him in one of his logic classes, and he did full-blown first-order predicate calculus, you know, with identity as in the intro to logic class. They didn't get any informal logic. They didn't get any classical logic. They didn't get any sentential logic. So they end up leaving the class um, thinking that all logic is is a bunch of games for manipulating symbols, and they really don't learn how to apply any of this stuff. There has to be some balance in any event. Um, do I have anything else here? I don't. The question is, do you? Do you think 
that what Hempel does supplies an adequate framework for explanation in science? And he's defending not just explanation, but causal explanation. And that he's defending the notion that there's really no difference between causal explanation and the kind of teleological ex explanation we get in the social sciences, or, or folks concerned with explanations of human behavior. What else I'm like that is that it can apply to the social sciences, or even something that some people might dismiss outright, like folk psychology, because the, the framework isn't, isn't exclusive. It can allow any sort of explanation, so long as your truth conditions are, are up to a certain standard. So I like that it doesn't leave out, it doesn't, it doesn't exclude other uh, social sciences or something like that. That's that, that yeah. true. Um, it is rather inclusive in that way. But you really need to understand a thing or two about logic in order to understand this framework. The deductive nominological model of explanation requires that you deduce the explanandum, that is the statement describing what needs to be explained, from the evidence. And the evidence must include laws, or a law, must include the antecedent conditions, that is the empirically uh, verified, testable statement expressing the, the antecedent of whatever the law is. Right? Then you, can deduce, conclude, or infer that the explanandum must be true. The point is, uh, you, can't, you can't do that unless you understand something or other about the nature of logic and appreciate the value of logic in eliminating ambiguity and uh, other problems that we have when, when all we're using is English to express arguments in English. Um, so that's one, yeah, it's, okay, it's better. Uh, what else we got? Any other thoughts about whether this is an adequate explanation, adequate framework for explanation and prediction? Yeah. It, just, it just looks clear to me, mm. it's easier to understand at first glance. When yeah. you like, you just state the laws that are applying to this situation, and then show the conditions of the whatever is in the situation, and then say therefore, like like the copper wire. Right. It just it just makes it clear to me. It certainly does that, and that's an advantage of what he supplies here. What, what I meant to say was the DN model, the deductive bit you get, you've seen lots of examples of that. Where does the nominological bit come in, in the deductive nominological model? Laws, right? Laws are, I mean, it's, the root has to do with, yeah, which means law. So that's where you get the deductive nominological model of scientific explanation. Another name for this is the covering law model. So you need, um, that is some event to be explained. That's the explanandum. That's the statement describing the event to be explained. It ends up being subsumed, is the word that he uses, under the law and th that statement expressing the antecedent conditions. That that's what supplies um, the framework for providing the explanation. So I've got two, yeah, it's better than any alternative. It's got some advantages. Any disadvantages to what you see here? It doesn't talk about, it doesn't talk about the truth itself. I mean, it, not that that's its purpose, but it assumes, it assumes the truth of uh, laws and of, of empiricism. Not that it's supposed to be addressing that, but it's just, it, it does assume that. Yeah, no one piece can do everything. Right. And, and here in this piece, he does say that, go back to the conditions of adequacy that uh, the sentences constituting the explanations must be true. Um, that is in the empirical condition of adequacy here. The problem is he doesn't really talk about laws being true. I guess he is assuming, presupposing that laws are the sort of, thing, sorts of things that can be true. And one of the pieces we're going to read very shortly is going to question that very notion. Um, not just whether laws can be true, but strictly speaking, most laws end up being false. And if the laws are false, then we end up um, with serious problems here with this uh, empirical condition of adequacy. If laws aren't true, and laws, generally speaking, aren't the sort of things that are true, then really what work are laws doing in our explanations? He's presupposing that laws are the sorts of things that can be true and they really don't have any problems with them. Now, he wrote a lot about this stuff, so it's not like he didn't think about it. He addresses it elsewhere, but we can't you know, spend most of the class just doing Hempel. So I'd probably like it, uh, given all the logic stuff. But we are going to be dealing with that issue explicitly. So first, you need to understand what the DN model requires, the parts of it, and how the parts work. Um, you need to understand what he means by laws. And they have certain features, right? But over the next couple of classes, we're going to explore in more detail whether Hempel's analysis of the, the nature of explanation, in particular laws, is adequate. So the question on the one-minute argument 
uh, in the forum has to do with right now, before you read these other pieces, what is it you think uh, about Hempel um, in terms of uh, the laws? Because <coughs> there are some issues here that we do need to explore. So notwithstanding Jonathan's tome, and we did cut some of it out. We got through yeah. it pretty quick. It was a pretty... No, I have no problem with it. Um, no, as, as presentations go, this is an excellent one. Do you all have any questions for me? Then who's up for... You're up? Okay. Um, that's all I got. Have a good weekend. I'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs>